What superhero did you want to be when you were little? You may think about that. What superhero did you want to be? I want to be Batman. Right? I, want, I really want to be Batman. I'm, and I'm, I'm the son of Richard and Joyce Voss, Mount Pleasant, Iowa, small town in Iowa, 7,000 people. Um, and my mom at the time was a stay-at-home mom, which the world has now come to recognize how difficult of a job that was. But uh, small town in Iowa, so she bought, you know, she, she, uh, what stay-at-home stay moms did back then was, um, I want to be Batman, so she went to the local sewing store, you know, bought the material, bought, bought little, uh, uh, the cutout patterns and made one of those little cows for me, you know, a Batman mask and a cape, and I can remember running around the house and running around the yard as Batman. You know, but that doesn't work out that well as a grown-up, right? When you begin, you know, try to imagine that Batman's dating profile. What would it say? You know, where's the mask has issues? <laughs> All right, so instead, I became an FBI agent. So, a little bit more about what I did as an FBI agent. Um, I was the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator. What did that mean? That meant that anybody, any American got kidnapped anywhere in the world, it was my job to get them out. And you might ask yourself, how often is the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator busy? Well, uh, it's a big world and a lot of Americans do stupid things. <laughs> so I was busy a fair amount of the time. But I had to learn, the key to negotiation, and which I had learned about kidnapping negotiation, is it doesn't matter what it is to you. The issue is, what is it to the other side? Uh, kidnapping to us is a horrible thing. Somebody's family member got ta taken, their life is being threatened. To the other side, do you know what a kidnapping negotiation is to the other side? Another day of work. It's a job. The first time I, I showed up to get the, uh, the training to to become an international kidnapping negotiator, specialized training. I expected, you know, they were gonna teach us, you know, voodoo spells, secret handshakes. I didn't know what we were gonna learn. My colleague stood up in front of us and said, in, in any country that you go into, you're gonna find out that uh, there's gonna be an expected initial demand, there's gonna be a percentage that they expect to settle for, and there's gonna be expected amount of time that they think the kidnapping will last. Now, I, I don't know what's occurring to you right now, but I grew up, you know, my father was an entrepreneur. He had a small business, and I always took an entrepreneurial attitude, uh, business attitude towards everything I did, and I sat there and I thought, he just described a market and the commodities human beings, which initially horrified me. But then I thought, that's just the way it is. To them, to them it's a market. To them, it's a business. Kidnapping is a business. Whatever country that it exists in, it's a business. Now, most of, most of the industries, most of the markets in the world, they end up grabbing Americans by accident. Usually if they grab an American, it's a dual national. They don't know they've grabbed an American. How is that possible? You know, because we assume that in the movies, like Americans that look like me, you know, clearly, obviously American, we're the targets, but we're not. They grab Americans by accident. How is that possible? And pick on the people in the front row because you guys got the most comfortable chairs. <laughs> right, uh, miss, right here. Uh, you're an American citizen. Yes. How'd you get your citizenship? I actually immigrated from a different country. You immigrated from where? Russia. Excellent. So you did it the hard way because you got to jump through a lot of hoops to get your citizenship. What about the young lady sitting right next to you? Uh, no. Yes. You're from Ecuador. Are you an American citizen? How'd you get your citizenship? Through your father, what, and, and how does that happen? Did it the hard way. You know how I got my citizenship? I was born here. How many countries in the world are you a citizen of that country simply by being born there? Do you guys know? I, you know, I grew up in Iowa. I didn't know. I thought it was a natural order of things. That, that was the way it should be worldwide. It's argued, that there, it's argued, and then I'll clarify it a little bit, that there are two developed nations, U.S. and Canada, the only developed nations, if you will. Not one country in Europe. Are you a citizen of that country if you're born in that country? Simply by being born there. Just soleil, I think, is the Latin, means right of the soil. As it turns out, it's largely 
a legal idea, if you will, of the Americas. Most of the countries in North and South America, you're a citizen of that country if you're born there. But it becomes an issue with dual nationals because, and in Haiti in particular, because at this time Haiti was a revolving door of kidnapping, Haitian moms know that the very best gift they could possibly give their child on their child's literal first birthday is a gift of American citizenship and the rights and privileges that that conveys. Simply be born an American. You have those of us born with that without even realizing it, we're given an advantage over probably 90% of the rest of the world. The United States wouldn't even be discussing a wall if American citizenship wasn't that big of a deal. So Haitian moms, one way or another, want to give their child that gift on the child's literal first birthday, legal or illegal, they're finding their way into American soil, and that's why so many Haitians are dual nationals, because they were born in America, and their mom found their way there. That's why so many Americans are being grabbed in Haiti at the time. I remember talking to a member of the press saying, if so many Americans are, are getting grabbed, why isn't it making the press? We work three, four kidnappings a week. Well, what's the first rule? Something's, something's in the media. If it bleeds, it leads. People aren't getting killed. We're doing our job. So a 12-year-old boy gets grabbed in Haiti in a kidnapping. I get the call. Now, the business model, again, you got to, in any given negotiation, your negotiations, regardless of who it's with, it's not what's on the line for you. What's on the line for the other side? It's a business in Haiti. And like any businesses, they have a division of labor. The commodity is human beings. They have people that acquire the commodity. They have people that transport the commodity. They have people that store the commodity. They have people that negotiate for the commodity's release. Many of you have seen the movie Man on Fire with Denzel Washington. By the way, Denzel Washington played me or a version of me in about three movies. He doesn't call, he doesn't write, I don't get to go over to the house. <laughs> I don't get any thanks. But a man on fire, Denzel negotiated with The Voice. The Voice's job was to negotiate kidnappings. That's what he did for a living. So the business model in Haiti at the time, it was a, I w and this was Haiti before the earthquake. And I will tell you, I was impressed with the business model. It was a great business model. Carjack a car with more than one person in it. Let one of those people go. You've just handled your marketing. There's no notifications necessary. <laughs> they knew each other well enough to ride in a car together. When you let one of them go, you can say, hey, Jimmy got kidnapped. You know, the kidnappers have got Jimmy. You pre-qualified your customer. They got money for a car and gas in Haiti. It's a poor country. They got money for ransom. Now, here's the best aspect of this business model, which I, I love, the genius part of it. What happens if you grab the one person in that family that nobody likes? <laughs> you got a car. You're going to get paid no matter what. It's a perfect transaction. So 12-year-old boy's been grabbed in Haiti. He's an American citizen. Nobody else in his family is. His father knows he's an American citizen. His son is entitled to health for the United States government. He goes to the local State Department and says, my son's a citizen. He's been kidnapped. And the State Department says, the FBI is going to be there to help you. Now, I don't know what will go through your mind. If a member of your family got kidnapped and you were told the FBI was going to be there to help you, I could imagine to some degree, you'd probably imagine maybe 15 minutes or so later, you're going to hear on the front door and these guys will be there. <laughs> maybe they got an FBI hat. <laughs> but instead, about 15 minutes later, he gets a call from some guy named Chris Voss in Washington, D.C. And he literally says to me on the phone, your in Washington, D.C., how are you going to help me? Now, how long have I got before he hangs up the phone? You or me? I'm sorry? Seconds. seconds. How many seconds? Ten, roughly. You or me, what do you say? What do you say? If you're in my position, what do you say? I will do everything in my power. How different is this from the interactions you're in every day? Anytime, first of all, the most dangerous negotiation is the one you don't know you're in. A 
that the words I want or I need or will you are coming out of your mouth. You're in a negotiation. And in every one of those negotiations, when you have an ask, when you're looking for collaboration, when you're looking for help from someone, which is a negotiation, how often is the other person not saying to themselves, how are you going to help me? And it's the nature of human interaction. And not every, you know, we in fact are thinking, what's in it for me? Not in a mercenary sense, but we're hardwired to collaborate. As a species, as a species, our ancestors were descended from collab people who collaborated. The caveman that didn't collaborate died alone in the dark. Those that collaborated did. We're hardwired to collaborate as human beings. And part of that is we want a quid pro quo. We want an interaction. We want reciprocity. We know that the person that we're about to help is going to help us. And we're all saying, how are you going to help me? And we all have the same amount of time that I had with this father on the phone. Whether or not you recognize it or not, you guys know the data on how long it takes to make a first impression? Seven to ten seconds. Same amount of time that I've got with this father. But that's not just first impression, that's ongoing interactions. You know, it, people's attention span isn't any less than it was 30, 40 years ago. It's just that it's more visible with the phones. But you see pictures from people riding trains 50 years ago, everybody's sitting there with their face in a newspaper looking out the window. We're still pretty much the same as we've always been. There aren't any huge changes in human nature, human nature wiring, if you will. This is what people are saying to themselves in all interactions, the same amount of time with everybody. What do you say? What do you say? How are you going to help me? I will tell you, as we work our way through this brief period of time we have, late this afternoon, there's two things I want to get across to you. First of all, let's take the word compassion and sympathy out of empathy. Let's make empathy just articulating our understanding of what the other side is thinking. It requires no sympathy or compassion. Empathy is a very compassionate thing to do. But it's not a necessary element of exercising it to be able to see what the other person is saying. Take Stephen Covey's guidance from way back when. Seek first to understand, then be understood, and just ramp it up a notch and seek first to demonstrate understanding in order to be understood. And hardwire your collaboration. Hit the hard wires that we all have inside us to collaborate, because they are there. The only reason people are not collaborating is not because they're mean, it's because they're scared. People's fears get in their way far more than anything else. How do we break down those fears? Now, the reason why I got this father in Haiti to collaborate with me is because I did it wrong before. The second part that I get to in a little bit in the talk, I'll talk about a kidnapping I worked in the Philippines. First time I'm in the Philippines, I'm in there at the express invitation of the American ambassador to the Philippines. Asked for me by name as well as the head of the FBI in the Philippines have asked for me by name. By name. As U.S. government's expert on kidnapping negotiation. I get walked into a room, the heads of the Philippine government are there. The president is the only person from the head of the government that's not there. And the only reason the president is not there is his personal advisor is. Secretary of Defense, the head of the Philippine National Police, a number of other military people. And in some substance, they ha say, how are you going to help us? And I take this as the opportunity to trot out my resume. FBI agent, leading the national kidnapping negotiator, member of the N New York City NYPD FBI Joint Terrorist Task Force for 14 years, winner the Attorney General's Award for Excellence in Law Enforcement, the FBI's Agents Association Award for Distinguished and Exemplary Service. Not only do I know the book that they teach from Aquantico, I wrote the book that they teach from Aquantico. And I could tell you that they were suitably unimpressed. They may as well have yawned in my face. Why is that? And this is something that you guys already know is true. Why were they unimpressed? Because a resume correlates loosely with whether or not somebody could do the job. 
loosely. If a resume correlated exactly with people being able to do the job, there would be no HR. <laughs> people would show up, slide their resume across the table, and they'd say, you're hired. And they'd keep their jobs. So your resume correlates loosely. What I say to that father? Here's what I said to the father. All right, Haitian kidnappers are not killing kidnap victims these days. I realize it's really stupid because they kill each other at the drop of a hat, but they're not killing kidnap victims. Now today is Thursday, and Haitian kidnappers love to party on Saturday night. If you say the things I want you to say when I want you to say them, we'll have your son out late Friday, early Saturday morning. He said, tell me what you want me to do. And we had his son out Saturday morning. So what was the gist of what I said? Because the two things that I had to establish in that seven to 10 seconds, which is an ongoing issue, are the two things that you consistently have to establish with your counterparts. Trust, exactly. What else? Somebody said confidence. I would ask you, now a lot of people think that, and it's, that's very common, it's competence. Would you rather have a confident plumber or a competent plumber? <laughs> <laughs>